bring value to um, each other and the communities that we're a part of. Roxbury Women means strength. I think it was a dynamic event. I was in the audience last year, if you didn't know that part. Last year was a dynamic event, and <laughs> this year um, I'm part of it, and it's just really amazing what a difference the year makes. So while everybody's getting the prop, you have the prop over here? Not yet. Okay. While everybody's getting the prop, I just want to share a little antidote. Um, I am, uh, I was the nurse practitioner before oncologist. Um, now I'm a nurse practitioner in radiation oncology, and I work at Mass General. And I was uh, in the hallways and bumped into one of my professors and um, was telling her I was going to be a speaker at TEDx and she didn't know what that was. But a resident was nearby and he heard us talking and he said, you're going to be in TEDx, oh my god, that's amazing. It's a, dr it, it's a dream of mine to speak at a TED event. So I just want to say that that really struck me as, as huge, you know, that, that I'm doing something that somebody's dreaming about and like how amazing it is. So, if you all have the cotton ball in your hand, I just want you to hold on to it <coughs> because I have an idea that I want to share with you. And that idea is, I think we all need to be softer. Now, getting back to the cotton ball, um, anytime you hear me say um, any variation of the word soft, I want you to think about, I want you to hold that cotton ball, caress that cotton ball, and I want you to think about the comfort you feel in holding something so soft and so delicate. And um, think about how it makes you feel. So as I said, I think we all need to be softer. Right? Um, <laughs> those who know me really well in my personal life are probably a little surprised, a little bit surprised to hear me say this because you know me um, uh, and you know that sometimes I can be a guarded, um, fiery, punchy individual, but um, I've seen by the lessons I've learned in life. Um, those who know me in my professional world as an oncology nurse um, know that I really focus my work on a soft approach with my cancer patients. Um, and as somebody who is uh, journeying towards a career in academia, I'm currently getting my doctorate degree. Um, I want to teach my students. The goal, what, the goal of what I want to teach my students is how to be soft. Um, so I want to take you guys back in time with me. Um, to 1994, I was 18 years old. I was a freshman at an all-women's Catholic college here in Boston. And I chose that type of learning environment because as a teenager, I was a bit boy crazy. And my mom's in the audience, so she can testify. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that by going to an all-women's <coughs> college, um, I would be able to focus on my education. Little did I realize, now we're not talking about the Leah today, we're talking about 18 year old Leah. Little did I realize there were other colleges in the vicinity of mine, and those <laughs> colleges had boys. <laughs> there was one particular boy who caught my attention, who was extremely attractive, he was a football player, very popular, and um, he found me attractive a little bit surprising to me, but I thought, like, yeah, great. Um, so we started dating, and uh, two months into our, rela our relationship, um, I got pregnant. And, um, it, you know, it was, it was crazy. Here I was, 18, a freshman in college on my own for uh, the first time. I was pregnant, and I was, you know, totally, totally scared. Um, <coughs> It was just a very overwhelming time. Um, today, I don't know if the, that is an image. Today, uh, having my daughter was the best decision that I ever made in my life. And today, being literal, because today is December 6th. And, um, and, um, and today is December 6th, and it's my daughter's 19th birthday. <laughs> You know, being a pregnant teen really felt like it was a deal breaker. I had no idea what I was going to do with this newborn. I clearly knew at that time I wasn't going to be able to finish college with a newborn baby. Um, I didn't know where we were going to live. I had no money, and I had no idea how I was going to uh, pay for a child, let alone myself. Um, 
in the first few years of my daughter's life, I was a single parent. Um, we almost had to live in a shelter, and I had to go on welfare. Now, at the time, I was mortified uh, that I had to go on welfare, not because I didn't need the help, because I certainly did, but when you're involved in a system like that, it's a system that um, is really good at, um, it's unfortunate, really good at keeping an oppressed woman feeling even more oppressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it really was. It was very sad. Um, so you know, um, here I am. I'm 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 pregnant and um, just really feeling like society's against me. And I really felt like I was going to be judged. You know, I'm young. I'm black. I'm pregnant. And I just really just thought everybody in the world was judging me. And I sort of likened my situation to that of my father. My father was a very forward-thinking, strong African-American man. He um, grew up here in Boston. His highest level of education was a high school degree. He worked in public health. And um, at one point in his career, he was, um, he was appointed commandant of the soldier's home in Chelsea, Massachusetts um, by Governor Dukakis. Very cool. Um, he was a veteran and he was my hero. Medically, my father had uncontrolled hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, he was a smoker, he was a heavy social drinker, he was a workaholic and he was a stressaholic. Um, and tragically, at um, age 41, my father passed away from a massive heart attack. I was 13 years old when that happened. So, um, you know, time passed, and when I got to nursing school, I remember we were learning about the cardiovascular system, and I was thinking about, um, well, they taught us all the factors that made people prime candidates for a heart attack. So as I said, I listed all these things about my father that put him in this sort of medically templated picture of what a heart attack was. And I was devastated to realize that some of those factors, which are modifiable, um, took his life and, and really at, at a young age. Um, so in my mind, as a pregnant teenager, I thought about this list of things that made my father medically templated for his um, unfortunate demise. And I thought about how tragic and, and worried and scary I felt when I was a pregnant teen. And you know, just thought that young black female were the things that were going to medically template me into um, you know, what this idea was of others, uh, that others would have of me. Um, and so I expected to be judged. When I was pregnant, I was t uh, paired up with a nurse midwife obstetrician team. Um, at that time, I did not know what a nurse midwife was. Nurse midwives are, nurse midwives are um, sir, registered, registered nurses, they're advanced practice nurses who, um, have a specialized education in both midwifery and nursing. And they actually function as a primary health care provider for pregnant women. It's a part of nursing that I think is just such an amazing um, aspect and facet of nursing, and I have a lot of respect for nurse, for nurse midwives. Um, I, it was my, nurse, my nurse midwife, and her name was Biddy, who um, really kind of showed me that this idea that I had, that society was going to judge me and be against me, um, in her world, was polar opposite. She came to me, or I came to her, I should say, and she treated me with such a soft, gentle approach. She really spent time with me, she answered my questions, she alleviated a lot of my fears, she treated me just like she would have treated any one of her other patients as somebody who um, had a life growing inside of her and really needed to understand the transitions that her body was going to make over the next 40 to 41 weeks. Um, as an aside, um, I just want to say when I, when I was having this interaction with um, my nurse practitioner, I got really sick. And um, I had fever, I was in a lot of discomfort, I was eating and drinking, and nothing was staying down, and, and obviously I'm pregnant, and I'm knowing that this is not right. So I went in and I was seen by the obstetrician. The obstetrician looked at me and said, everything's fine, go home and rest, 
you're going to be okay. Later that day, I went back to the clinic, and it was my midwife who eval evaluated me that second time. She listened to my concerns. She, she physically evaluated me. She tapped my back on either side. And when I screamed out in pain, she diagnosed me with a kidney infection and admitted me to the hospital. Um, unfortunately, after that admission, my pregnancy would um, take, I guess, a turn for the worse. It, it wasn't good. And I would end up delivering my daughter prematurely. So um, that experience that I had with my midwife was just so empowering. I, I knew after seeing that doctor something was wrong because of some of the things that we talked about that she taught me um, when we talked, when we dialogued about the things that would be going on with my body. And I, I knew I should have gone back. And um, she really spent the time getting to know me. And um, when I look back at um, that time with her, I realized that that experience um, really placed a lot of emphasis for me on culture and understanding someone's culture when you're taking care of them. Um, it just uh, resonated with me that it's very important to understand the ins and outs of people. And I really felt like my midwife did that softly and gently. Um, so she really got to know me. And the way I identify myself is I'm part African American, as I said, my father was African American, and um, uh, my mother is Panamanian. Um, my mother is one of 17 children and a twin who came here from Panama in her early 20s by herself. Um, and she lived here for over two decades um, before any of her other family members, actually her twin sister, came to this country. Clearly, my parents are a source of uh, where I get my strength. Um, but um, my midwife also was. And so um, when I became a nurse, now a nurse practitioner, I realized that it's so important for me to take a soft approach to my patients. I really take the time to get to know them <coughs> inside and out. I, know, I like to know all aspects of them, front to back, left to right, forward, backward, center, all of it. And I really think getting to know somebody well entails understanding the nuances of their culture. So um, I'm very thankful to my nurse, my nurse midwife for teaching me this and for letting it kind of draw into my own profession. Um, so, you know, I really think that it's possible for us to give care softly. Um, what I do in nursing is something that can be transmitted and, and, and practiced in all of your lives. Um, you know, if we approach people with, with a gentle, soft approach, if we get to know them, nuances and all, if we appreciate the aspects of who they are, and, and when I say culture, I mean not just gender, race, ethnicity, religion, uh, sexual preference, but I mean all of it, the total of it. And if we get to know that about people, um, we really can make a difference. So um, I really think if we take time to be soft, to be gentle, to care, to be attentive, to listen more, to talk less, to not grab, but instead softly embrace, we can really make a difference in people's lives. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'd just like you to bear with me. I want you to kind of um, be attentive to your neighbor. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do is just kind of, this might be somebody you know. It might be somebody you're meeting for the first time. And what I want you to do, can you give me a hand? Can you hold the What I want you to do, um, I want somebody to choose to take the lead. And what I want you to do is I want the dominant person or the person who's taking the lead, I want you to um, hold your right hand and take their left hand into the palm of your right hand. So like this. And I want you to take the time. Left hand of the person. Okay. And I want you to whoever have the right hand, take your two fingers and trace it down the thumb of your neighbor and stop at their wrist. Does this work? <laughs> okay, so like this.
whoever has the right in them, take it and trace your middle and pointer finger down their thumb. And I want you to stop at their wrist. And then I want you to softly press your fingers into their wrist. What you're going to feel is their pulse. Their, the pulse is a measure of someone's heartbeat. In order, the pulse is a measure of someone's heartbeat. And in order for you to detect that pulse, you must be soft. Thank you. with other humans in this space is amazing. And it's nothing short of a miracle.